Hi, my name is Shannon Calvert and my pronouns are she, her. I'm originally from Western Australia, but today here on Gadigal Country. Um, my role is as a lived experience educator, working across multiple areas, um, but mainly mental health, eating disorders and palliative care. I identify as a lesbian woman, and today I'm here to speak about my experience with a severe and enduring eating disorder and recently just contributing to the included study at the Inside Institute of Eating Disorders. Thank you so much for joining Queer Conversation today. Yeah. We're great. here today to talk about a serious issue that I wasn't much aware that is affecting our community. Eating disorder and the LGBTQI plus community, I guess it is related to men mental health. Yes. You are here to promote a, an Australian first survey to actually gather Australian data about um, eating disorder and how it affects the LGBTQI plus community. And we're also going to talk about your own experience, how you dealt with it and um, how it was connected with your sexuality and, and your coming out. So the Inside Out Eating Disorders, um, it has a national recognition um, as a leading area for research, predominantly in the space of eating disorders and disordered eating. So they are constantly keeping um, up to um, date with um, you know, past research, previous research, but also considering future opportunities for research as well. Not only do that, they, they provide significant amount of resources for the community as well, but also to support clinicians and researchers and emerging researchers in that space to understand the lying and underlying causes of eating disorders and how it impacts the community. Um, eating disorders uh, significantly impact probably 1.25 million Australians. Um, it is often uh, a significant barrier in terms of early identification and recognition. So it's significantly under-resourced. Um, and there are a lot of people out there more broadly in the community that are struggling um, from all eating disorders. And so um, at the forefront of the Inside Our Institute um, and places like the Australian Eating Disorder Research um, Centre is to actually make sure that we get to the fundamental core reasons that impact people um, and how we can best support them. And how did the realisation come about that it affects the LGBTQI plus community? Why did they believe there needs to be a additional research to be done there? Well, like as you said, I mean, there's been some work done in the US and this particular study is the first that's actually been done in, in Australia to understand um, what are the indications and where is the prevalence lying from, um, whether it's exercise, um, body image, um, identity, whether it's trauma or mental health issues, and bringing those all collectively amongst the LGBTIQ community, especially for those who are adults experiencing that. And I think one of the things that we've learned over time as more people are stepping forward needing to access care for eating disorders is that a lot of people from the LGBTIQ plus community have um, delayed reaching out for support. Um, and then there's been uh, ways to try and understand actually how it's connected and potentially how we can best support people from that community if indeed it is their sexuality or gender that has impacted or been um, a potential influence uh, for them developing an eating disorder as well. Which are really important factors when we're looking at how we can best support um, people to recover because, you know, the truth is you actually can recover from an eating disorder, yet it has the highest mortality rate out of any mental illness as well. Do you reckon that the, the, that the fact of an identity crisis perhaps is part of a problem of an eating disorder and is that being recognised by counsellors? Some, yes. Um, I think it's really important that um, those in, whether health professionals or those that are actually working with people in the community need to be accountable to understand eating disorders more. It goes so much more beyond and are deep, you're often deeply entrenched um, than what we believe eating disorders to be on the surface, which is often related to image, um, dieting uh, and food related or body image issues. It's really critical to understand how eating disorders impact people, where the potential influences lie. So I think if you step into the space of having a counsellor or a psychologist or GP not have done that work to fully understand eating disorders more broadly, it's, they often go undiagnosed um, or inaccurately supported, which unfortunately 
It's like a revolving door for people um, accessing or going in and out of treatment. So I do think that there are some people that fully understand that there is a lot more to be said and that there are some influences and indicators of what causes it. But I would also say there's a lot out there that don't quite understand it. And I think we are biased, you know, um, and it's actually recognising those bias um, to best support people and, and look at a whole of person rather than their diagnosis. And am I right to say that it's particularly an issue for transgender people? That is... In terms of the, the data around that, um, it is a significant indicator and is definitely prevalent now, especially amongst really young people. And, you know, as someone that um, is not transgender or had, has always had to deal with, with, um, with that myself, I could only imagine how traumatic it must be trying to experience something that you're fully connected to but feel totally disconnected from. And um, so I think with eating disorders, again, it hasn't so much been around the vanity aspect, but more of the trying to control um, a connection with your body that ultimately at the end of the day, you don't have control over. But, you know, when we do diet or we try to change our shape, whether it's through exercise or, you know, what we eat, um, that's how we understand uh, manipulating our bodies in the community. So it's understandable that children and young people feel that by doing that, they could potentially, you know, influence their bodies to look differently. And you, you did say you were, you were happy to share your story yeah. with the community. So you've been diagnosed with an eating disorder at the young age of Gosh, 13? Or? Yeah, so I was officially diagnosed at 13, but I would probably say I started to have issues with my relationship with my body from about the age of 10. I had not ever thought of the connection for my eating disorder in relation to my sexuality. So for me, being able to have this conversation and to contribute to this piece of work has come genuinely and authentically because as I've done that, um, there has been so many self-realizations in my recovery that I'm deeply grateful for, but I had no idea throughout that experience that there was potentially even a connection to my sexuality and how that was impacting my possibility to even recover from my eating disorder, but also an underlying influence, I think, um, in terms of what needs my eating disorder was meeting, which I think in a lot of ways was to disconnect from recognizing that, you know, I had different needs, that I was potentially queer, that um, I think there was also that deep fear of what would that mean if how people perceived me would potentially change. And a sad reality is a lot of people in the LGBTIQ plus community have experienced significant amounts of discrimination, trauma, denial of care and treatment, um, serious mental health issues. and as someone that's experienced mental health issues and trauma, and even from having an eating disorder, the reality of coming out um, about my sexuality was probably even too, confront too confronting to consider because I come from that generation. I mean, I'm 46 now. I come from the generation where it wasn't really an open discussion and was probably looked down upon. So it wasn't fear of people looking down at me per se, but I was fear of losing people. Um, especially after losing so many around me because of the impacts of my eating disorder as well. I guess this is why I've asked before if you think that um, health professionals are um, trained of considering this issue because if you as a person who has experienced this, you didn't even, you know, it wasn't even in, in, in your thinking process. Like, Well, you make sense actually, and even, even just reflecting on, on what I've just shared, um, I think that that's such a good point, though, because for me, even throughout the 30 years of intervention and probably really invasive traumatic experiences, I don't think my sexuality was ever brought up or the potential um, recognition that that was going to be an important part of me, um, nor was gender rec recognition ever brought up um, 
you know, I've become very accustomed to what people presume um, who, I, of who I am. So, you know, people will look and think, oh, you're white, cisgender, heterosexual woman. And so it's only when people start to genuinely get to know me that I'm comfortable to, to share who I am with them more broadly. But in therapy, it's interesting because I think we, well, I've noticed that clinicians or health professionals at times could narrow down on a particular topic. And I think for me, it just seemed convenient after time to just kind of push myself into a box that I thought I was meant to fit. So my identity became all around this eating disorder. Um, and I didn't want to be pushed in any box. And so never ever got to the thought, well, actually you could, you could potentially fit in all ma many different um, boxes. And I actually, it's evident though, I think clinicians also have to, um, and health professionals, it's really critical that we understand, you know, what eating disorders are and, and how they impact people. But I think for us to actually provide genuine, authentic, person-centered care, is to understand all of the person. It's to understand their environment around them, the people in their lives, um, and to look in the underlying causes so that we can eventually give people an opportunity to explore what quality of life looks like for them. But if we're not having those conversations or even recognizing that being, um, you know, how people recognize themselves, whether it's through gender or sexuality, is very much a part of who they are. Um, but we, we haven't embraced that well, and we also haven't embraced the opportunity that would provide to support people to reach recovery um, because it's important for them to make that recognition, but it has to be supported and embraced as well. And I don't think we do that well. And it can really only be supported if there is information available. And yep. hence this research and the survey is so important. Have you got... Any information about what a survey contains? What kind of questions? What kind of information are they after? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I've just con I've just completed the survey, and I mean, I'm digressing a bit, but for me, obviously, as someone that's just come out, um, it was almost a peeling process to go through the survey. It's completely confidential, so you know you don't have to put your name out there or or who you are or where you're from, but. I think the questions were really thoughtful. It was actually co-designed or and, and developed by people in the LGBTIQ plus community. Um, it only took me about 15 minutes to fill out, but it asked really thoughtful questions. It helped to understand a bit more about who I was. Um, you know, you sort of, you know, your normal stats around whether I identify as a woman, roughly around my age and so on. And then it asks a few questions around your um, Body, body image related issues um, or potentially um, behaviors that are related to an eating disorder could potentially be an eating disorder or possibly disordered eating. I think it's really important to recognize that eating disorders are quite wide in terms of it's not just about anorexia nervosa. There's also bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, um, and there's quite a few others that we're learning to do some more work with. So it's just trying to capture that all of person picture. Um, and then it started to ask questions about how I chose to identify from my gender to my sexuality as well. So it wasn't confrontational by any means, but uh, it, it left me feeling curious actually in terms of how much amazing, like incredibly information that will contain to really get a, a broader picture of what the community is experiencing. So Shannon, do you have the address for the survey? I do, yes. It's at the included study um, and .com.au. So if you just go onto the website, it will provide some information about the research that's being done um, and also a bit about the survey uh, as well as the link to the survey as well. And I believe they're hoping to capture around a thousand experiences across the community. So I think people's contribution towards it will really help us genuinely understand the needs of the LGBTIQ plus community and how potentially eating disorders um, and disordered eating are um, basically a significant influence in terms of how people manage, um, you manage the challenges that sometimes the community faces. Mm. And so you are better now? Yes. When when was the big change in your life, and yeah. you're able you're even able to sit down and speak to 
you know, the public about um, two very complex topics, really, um, you feel comfortable enough. Mm -hmm. So so tell us what, what um, uh, happened in your life and um, perhaps how people can draw some some you know example out of this yeah sure look I mean thank you for giving me the opportunity and and like I say sometimes it's having authentic genuine conversations like this that um are often a privilege Brene Brown's got this wonderful saying that says you don't ever have to tell your story to anyone that hasn't deserved the right to hear it and I think for me that's taken a lot of time um to understand that my healing process for me has been on my terms um and in, uh, when it comes to actually recognizing my self-worth. So my eating disorder history is very complex and very long. And um, I probably started to experience, like I said, uh, just issues with almost, I don't know whether it was self-resentment, but noticing how much people define themselves by their bodies and what their bodies looked like when I was younger. So as I started to grow up and I wasn't a petite um, small uh, you know young girl and um, I didn't ever think that that wasn't that was something that I needed to to even be concerned about but then of course as you start to grow up things change your your needs change um, physically you start to change and I was I don't know there was a part of me that just didn't feel comfortable with who I was and I almost felt that I needed to control my body um, and my needs so I was diagnosed at 13, uh, and I think it was a really rocky road after that. So initially di diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. For most of my experience over the three decades was predominantly with anorexia nervosa, but I also experienced bulimia nervosa and episodes of binge eating disorder as well. The challenge of accessing care or, or receiving support at that time was, I think we had this very perceived understanding of what an eating disorder was so initially I didn't kind of meet the poster child version of what anorexia nervosa looked like. I wasn't significantly underweight um, and I hadn't displayed behaviors that people perceived eating disorders to to um, to actually um, follow through with and so I I guess my, my treatment initially was quite confronting and short-lived and then um, I realized over time I ended up going in and out of hospital, uh, in and out of psychologist offices. Um, I was told that I was treatment re resistant because the type of care that I was receiving wasn't necessarily supporting um, my needs. And I think I like to believe that people were doing the best they could with what they understood at the time. But I was working with people that hadn't actually done further work on understanding eating disorders. Um, unfortunately, when I had a significant relapse towards my late 20s, um, that led me down a very traumatic treatment path. So I was in and out of um, mental health units and hospitals um, to the point where probably around my mid-30s, my mother, who was my, um, who was my most um, profound person in my life, but also an incredible support in my life, um, went through a lot of trauma having to experience me basically dying in front of her. And unfortunately, I think around the age of 35, we were called into the psychologist's office where they said, look, I think, you know, you're not going to survive this and um, we need to stop preparing for your, for your end of life. So we hadn't anticipated I would make it to my 40th birthday. Um, I guess so much happened over then. So even though I've had such a long history with my eating disorder, it certainly didn't take 30 years to recover. Around probably the latter part of my eating disorder experience, um, I had been, I had received so much trauma in treatment, again, through what I believe was just treatment teams um, doing what they could under the circumstances. They didn't understand eating disorders. They hadn't necessarily had appropriate training um, and it wasn't the appropriate environment either. So um, unfortunately, their way to manage it was, um, you know, it basically caused further repercussions over time. Eventually, I started to see a psychologist that had done further training and understanding of eating disorders. But alongside that, I ended up working with a more of a multidisciplinary team, which is 
a wonderful opportunity to work with different specialties, but people that can on, almost capture all of your needs rather than just one part. Um, and in this particular instance, um, there were people trying to understand more, but it was probably the compassion that I think and the patience that came with um, accepting um, my needs, but then also recognizing that because I'd had such a long history, it was going to take some time. Having that compassion in comparison to quite a punitive approach, I think there was a history of people believing eating disorders were a choice, that I was purposely doing this to myself because I wanted to lose weight and be thin and look good, um, to all of a sudden actually having people that understood that there was so many underlying factors. So that compassion, I think, planted a really important seed for me um, towards my recovery, which certainly doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it takes a lot of work. And can I tell you that recovering over the age of 40 is tricky, especially when there's all these other adult things we have to fig figure about ourselves, including our sexuality. Um, but it was a starting point in something that um, I desperately needed to have survived this. And I think all the work that I've had to do after that has been something that I've embraced and certainly don't regret, um, as challenging as it's been. I think the other reason, though, that drove me to do the work that I do now as a lived experience educator is if we look at the broader system, um, mental health is significantly fragmented uh, in terms of people accessing care and finding important pathways to meet their needs. But eating disorders, more than probably most, is significantly under-resourced, um, underfunded, and the demand for eating disorder treatment, specialised treatment now, is much higher than it has been ever before. And um, the way for people to have an opportunity to recover is early intervention and identification, So, um, which is why the survey is so important as well, is just to see whether contributing factors could be potentially be as well for the LGBTIQ plus community. The sooner we can support someone or recognise the eating disorder, they won't have to go down a, a road like I've been. And mm. when I experienced this compassionate approach to care and genuinely um, believing in people that wanted to understand and know more, I thought we've got to do things differently. We can do things differently. And so for me, my recovery was a bit of an eye for an eye. I thought, I'm going to expose eating disorders as much as I possibly can because I know we can do better in the community. What advice could you give to somebody who's listening today and they're isolated, they don't know where to go? Yeah, I so understand that isolation and I think, I think there's so much fear behind that because we know how people have been treated in the past. Um, we know that the LGBTIQ plus community, for example, has been um, marginalised in ways they should never have been. But then we come to the stigma and understanding around eating disorders and many people will still think that it's influenced by body image and vanity alone. The reality is, is there are some really good people out there, dedicated people that are saying, no, actually that's not the case. And they believe that we need to understand more about people. We need to meet people where they're at. We need to meet people's needs. But most importantly, support people that are struggling in this isolation, that are staying away because they're so fearful of what people are going to think. Um, I genuinely and wholeheartedly believe we're in a safer place and time to come out now. Come out with your experience, whether it's with mental ill health and eating disorders. And I hope that people can embrace their sexuality. I, I know that we've all had different journeys and experiences and I've only done this much later. But had I have done it earlier, um, I could see how I would have allowed myself a lot more of an opportunity to experience a quality of life that I didn't have. Um, as I said, I don't have regrets, but I think the sooner, um, with courage and um, you know, determination to actually put ourselves out there in the world, I think people will embrace us to do exactly that and support us with, you know, understanding whether it's our eating disorder and disordered eating and what lies behind it. But also, you know, you know, embracing people's diversity as well. Do you know the um, support helpline number or website that people could reach out to as a first step? 
Yes, of course. So look, there is um, fortunately there's a lot more emerging emerging uh, resources out there. So I know if you go to the Inside Out Institute for Eating Disorders website, there is a lot of resources and information there as well about understanding eating disorders, even for people that may think a loved one or someone they care about has an eating disorder. The Butterfly Foundation also has a helpline. Um, so if you, and then their helpline is open uh, many a time and I would all, and you can actually speak to someone if you have any concerns for yourself or for someone. Um, and even if it's, if you're not sure, you know, sometimes it's tricky to know if you have an eating disorder, so, or even disordered eating, uh, it's really helpful to unpack that with someone who will not judge the questions and curiosity that you take into that conversation. For Lifeline as well, they're always open to embracing all of the person, uh, a very supportive helpline for mental ill health. And then we have um, a couple of emerging um, organisations, again, very much focused around eating disorders. We have um, ANZ and the credentialing that will support professionals who are wanting to work um, with people with eating disorders or specialise in that area. Um, and then the National Eating Disorder Collaboration um, has a lovely way of bringing all different types of expertise, like lived experience expertise into the room so we can understand it more and what our system needs. Thank you so much for coming in today and sharing this with our listeners. Yes, I just hope that people uh, find the courage and the they also recognise their own rights to be able to, to look into the study and see if it's something that's impacted them as well. Mm -hmm.